y'all. Welcome to Joy. We're so glad that you've joined us for worship today. We're ready for a good service, and we hope that you are prepared wherever you are to join us. We trust that no one is here by accident, but we're all here by divine appointment. I don't know about you, but I need a divine appointment today. So I'm grateful to be in this house, and I'm grateful that we are able to be in yours. So join us for worship. I want to first start off by reminding you of some incredible announcements. We still want to stay plugged in with each other, even though we're all spread apart. Remind you that today, the third Sunday, is always our 12 Baskets Sunday, and we are doing our 12 Baskets for the last three months have been for school supplies for our children who are clients of the food pantry. We ask that you drop those off today from 12 to 2. Miss Jackie and Miss Judith will be here to receive your supplies for our kids, so we're thankful for your generosity and trust that these are other ways that we feed hungry people. So thank you for being a part of that also remind you that we're continuing to stay connected through our community check-ins. We have that tonight at 7 on Zoom, as well as Friday evenings at 5 on Zoom. We hope you'll join us. It's just good to see your faces, hear how things are going, and pray with and for one another. Also, um, remind you that we're in the midst of a spiritual transformation series entitled How Happiness Happens, and we hope that you will join us. We've had some incredible lessons, even on Zoom, through this time, so we pray that you will join us for a transformational moment in the middle of the week. And then you have the following night is our bilingual prayer and praise service, Ale Bonza with Reverend Stanley. We trust that this is a great time to come. Uh, remember your heritage, sing songs with which you are familiar, and just join together for some Bible study and worship. We're grateful that we have this opportunity to still stay connected with our bilingual community, and we're grateful to offer such a thing. Woo! And then, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. We're, we're online yet? We're online. We're live. Okay. Yes, right we're, yes, we're live. I'm running late. Reverend Sue's going to kill me. Tell them about the T-shirts. The yes, t -shirts. the T-shirts. For those of you who did not purchase them before, we brought them back. We're praying that we can sell at least 50. We're shooting for 100. But get your Joy T-shirts right now. Wear Joy and share Joy. George is wearing his yellow one today up doing the camera. We hope that you will uh, support us and then share us as you go out um, throughout the week. So get your Joy shirts ASAP, a good way to, uh, to continue to support Joy. Thank you for that. And now let's move on. Um, you can get connected to us via our Facebook page, Instagram. You can email us for more information at info at joymcc.com. Like and share our post so that we can continue to spread joy throughout the world. And now as we move closer to the time of worship, we want to set the stage with our threshold moment. Happiness. Everyone craves it, wants it, searches for it. We each long for a sense of contentment and well-being, particularly in our COVID captivity. Worldwide, people profess that happiness is their most cherished goal. We think we know where to find it. The often used front door to happiness is one described by advertising companies, acquire, retire, and aspire to drive faster, dress trendier, and drink more. Happiness happens, they suggest. When you lose the weight, get the date, find the mate, or discover your fate. It's why this front door to happiness, or so they say. In a survey of Americans, only 35% said they were happy, which means a cloud of grayness perpetually overshadows two out of three people. How do we explain the doom? We're using the wrong door. The motto on the front door says, happiness happens when you get the sign on the lesser used back door counters that with happiness happens when you give. And standing at the entrance is none other than Jesus, whose life throughout the scripture urges us to find happiness in helping one another. Throughout the next six weeks, we will open the door to happiness by accepting one another, bearing with one another, serving one another, forgiving one another, carrying one another's burdens, and finally loving one another. This Sunday, we begin by accepting or welcoming one another, particularly those we don't like or are unlike us, even those who are most like us that might just get on our nerves. 
as we open the door to acceptance, let's begin with some praise and worship. Pray with me. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come into this safe place, to this haven of hope. God, wherever we are, we are joined together as Joy Metropolitan Community Church. And God, we thank you that as we open the door to acceptance, we know you have already accepted us just as we are. So God, we want to take just a little bit of time to open ourselves up to all that you would have for us. So God, enter into this space, enter into this room, enter into their rooms. God, enter into our hearts so that in everything we do, we might worship you. Thank you, God, in advance for what your spirit will do. As always, we ask this in the mighty, matchless, marvelous name of Jesus. Amen. grab a kid and have them pray for you because they haven't learned how to not have faith yet. <laughs> but I'm telling you that there's nothing better at all in the whole world. In the whole world. Yeah. Pandemic or no pandemic. In the whole world. Good times and bad times. There's nothing nothing better than knowing Jesus. There's nothing better
morning, Joy. This morning, before we do prayers of the people, we will start off by having our first Sunday in which we acknowledge Hispanic Heritage Month. Many of us prefer the word Latino or Latina Heritage Month because we're inclusive to our Brazilian sisters and brothers and our sisters and brothers from Belize. So as we honor the brown people from Latin America, today we begin by acknowledging and honoring the life of Roberto Clemente. Roberto Clemente was born on August 18, 1934 in Carolina, Puerto Rico. He rose to the ranks as the first Latino major baseball player who played with the Pittsburgh Pirates under the number of 21. Clemente was an all-star, was in an all-star games for 13 seasons, playing 15 all-star games. He was the National League's most valuable player, the National League's batting leader from 1961 to 1967, the Gold Glove Award winner for 12 consecutive seasons. He had a batting average of over um, .300, and for 13 seasons, he had made 3,000 hits during his major league baseball career. He was a two-time world champion. But my sisters and brothers, to us, he was a lot more than just a baseball player. He was a civil rights activist, and he was an advocate for the Spanish-speaking people of the United States of America at a time where the only other person other than him was Cesar Chavez, who organized the unions of the Southwest. Roberto Clemente was traveling throughout the country advocating for himself and other people of Latin descent. When he first came to Florida in 1954, he was segregated from the white players in his team and was forced to stay in places where only black Americans were able to stay. As a black Puerto Rican, he quickly developed an affinity and political connection with other black players and learned to fight for civil rights during the late 50s and 60s. Oftentimes, the press labeled him as a whiner and a complainer because he would not keep his mouth shut and just play baseball. You see, sometimes people prefer the brown people. They like it when you fix their roofs and when you mow their lawns and when you take care of their children. But when you have a political opinion, you're considered the whiner. And he used his voice through the press to defend and fight for civil rights advocating against racism and as an Afro-Boricua, he was devoted to his work and very committed and connected to the work of Dr. King during the civil rights era. He was deeply devoted to charity, charitable work and he organized and worked in Puerto Rico and throughout the United States for justice for all people. On December 31st, 1972, Roberto Clemente died. He died heading on a mission trip from Puerto Rico to Nicaragua, where he was taking food, clothes, and money directly to the families in Nicaragua who were victims of the earthquake. I remember the day he died. I was just a little boy. And that morning when we heard on New Year's Eve that Roberto Clemente has lost his life, many of us cried, people in the community gathered, and people in the community mourned his death. Singers sang songs about him. Schools have been named after him. Streets are named after him. Entire plazas in Puerto Rico and in Chicago and in New York and even here in Orlando bear his name. In fact, the new school uh, by Semeron Avenue is Roberto Clemente Middle School. So we honor him with pride and we honor him with love. And today for Hispanic Heritage Month, we acknowledge the life of Roberto Clemente. And now as we move to the prayers of the people, saints gather with me as we come before our Lord and pray. Lord, we thank you for your life. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the brown people of this nation. We thank you for the black people of this nation. We thank you for the white people of this nation. We thank you for everyone that is in this nation, that we will grow together and love and become united and live the dream that Roberto Clemente fought for that we would be a nation of justice and equality. Lord, we lift the prayers of the people before you this morning. We pray for those that are sick, for those who may be in pain or may be suffering. And we ask you to descend your spirit upon our church, our mission, and our nation as we say the prayer that your son taught us to pray while he walked on this earth. Our creator, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear Joy, Nuestra escritura de hoy viene del apóstol San Pablo, Cartas a los Romanos, capítulo 15, versículo 7 al 13. Escucha hoy estas palabras de aceptarse unos a otros. Así pues aceptense los unos a los otros, como también Cristo aceptó a ustedes para gloria de Dios. Puedo decirle que Cristo vino a servir a los judíos para cumplir las promesas hechas a nuestros antepasados y demostrar así que Dios es fiel a los que promete. Vino también para, para que los no judíos alaben a Dios por su misericordia, según dice la Escritura. Por eso te alabaré entre las naciones y cantaré himnos a tu nombre. En otra parte, la Escritura dice, Alegres en naciones con el pueblo de Dios. Y a otro lugar dice, Naciones y pueblos todos alaben al Señor. Isaías también escribió, Brotará la raíz de Jesús, que se levantará para gobernar a las naciones las cuales pondrán en su esperanza que Dios que da esperanza lo llene de alegría paz a ustedes que tienen fe en él y les dé abundante esperanza por el poder del Espíritu Santo Good morning Joy Happy Sunday Our scripture lesson today comes from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15, verses 7 through 13. Hear now these words of accepting on one another. So reach out and welcome one another to God's glory. Jesus did it, now you do it. Jesus, staying true to God's purposes, reached out in a special way to the Jewish insiders so that the old ancestral promises would come true for them. As a result, the non-Jewish outsiders have been able to experience mercy and to show appreciation to God. Just think of all the scriptures that will come true in what we do. For instance, then I'll join outsiders in a hymn sing, I'll sing to your name. And this one, outsiders and insiders rejoice together. And again, people of all nations celebrate God. All colors and races give hearty praise. And Isaiah's words, there's the root of our ancestor, Jesse, breaking through the earth and growing tree tall, tall enough for everyone, everywhere, to see and take hope. Oh, may the God of green hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, so that your believing lives, filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit, will brim over with hope. Esta es la palabra de Dios para el pueblo de Dios. This is the word of God for the people of God. Whether it's your friends, your family, your neighbors, and especially that one you don't know, be sure and do this assignment.
Joy. It's good to be with you today to bring you today's contemporary word from Max Lucado's book, How Happiness Happens. I'll be reading from the eighth chapter called Discomfort Zones. Hear now these words of wisdom. Brian Reed served in a military unit in Baghdad, Iraq in the fall of 2003. He and his unit went on regular street patrols to protect neighborhoods and build peace. It was often a thankless, fruitless assignment. Citizens seemed more interested in a handout than a hand up. Brian said his unit battled low morale daily. An exception came in the form of a church service his men stumbled upon. The soldiers got out of their military vehicles, intrigued by the sight of a wrought iron nativity. Three wise men from the east advertising to all who passed that this was a Christian gathering in a Christian church. Brian and his men, armed and armored to the teeth, entered the facility. It was filled with Arabic-speaking Coptic Christians singing and praising God with a worship team and PowerPoint slides. The Americans didn't understand a word, but they recognized the images on the screen, a depiction of Jesus. The language was foreign, but the observances were not fellowship, prayer, the teachings, and the breaking of bread. When they saw the American soldiers, the Coptic Christians invited them to partake in the Lord's Supper with them. The soldiers removed their helmets and received the sacraments. They then joined the Iraqis on a processional as they made their way out of the sanctuary into a courtyard that ended at the foot of a large wooden cross. Afterward, they smiled, laughed, shook hands, and prayed again. It was peace in the Middle East. Brian wrote, Jesus was there. He showed up in the very place some of us were ready for our Air Force brethren to blow off the face of the earth. God spoke to me that evening, he said, celebrating the Lord's Supper and remembering Jesus' sacrifice was the most important bridge builder and wall destroyer we could have experienced. Opposite yous brought together by the cross of Christ. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Amen. At the table of grace, cups never empty, plates always full, it's never too late to come and be filled with love never ending. You're always welcome at the table of grace. Pray with me. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to your table, to open up your word, and God, to hear and find acceptance for just who we are and just who all those other people may be, even those opposite us. God, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to, to study and to understand and to hear and respond to your word. Open us up, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Are you surprised at those statistics that we mentioned at the threshold moment about just how incredible it is, how we search for happiness and so few of us find it, that we profess that happiness is our most cherished goal? Would you believe that the most popular class in the three-century history of Yale University is on happiness? We want happiness, but... As I mentioned in that threshold moment, only a third of us Americans surveyed said that we were happy. Note this information was written in our focus book published in 2019 prior to COVID-19 and the mess 2020 has become. I would venture to say then that that number is even less today. In the nine-year history of the Harris Poll Survey of American Happiness, the happiest index was a mere 35%. I wonder what it is today, September 20th, 2020, especially after Ruth Bader Ginsburg died on Friday. 
obviously this means that a perpetual grayness overshadows 67% of our population. Even the World Health Organization forecasted that by this year in 2020, depression would become the second leading cause of disease worldwide. Again, this was prior to COVID. So what do you think explains the doom and the gloom? The answers are varied and complex, but among them is this idea that, as I mentioned earlier, as we stood by our doors, that we are opening the wrong one. We've spent years seeking to obtain happiness by obtaining wealth, wisdom, status, and stuff. We've all been told money can buy happiness, but we all know that's a lie. We've seen happy hobos and miserable millionaires, right? We think a change in jobs or journeys, locations, or even looks may help. However, we merely need to change doors. Lucado says in his book, How Happiness Happens, the motto on the front door says, happiness happens when you get. The sign on the lesser used back door counters with this argument, happiness happens when you give. And I think about the doors to my parents' home. The front door was hardly ever used besides the fact that our house was on top of the hill and you had to walk up like 15 steps to get to the front door and the back door, there were less steps. But if you knew who we were, and you were accepted in our home, you always used the back door, never ever the front. Doing good, you see, does the doer good. We need to stop going to the front door expecting to get happiness and go out the back door to give it away. So today I want us to explore how we can open the door to happiness by first opening the red door of acceptance. There are 59 one another statements listed throughout the scriptures. Max Lucado has grouped them into six statements. And he starts with the accept one another statement because he believes that this one is the gateway to all the other one another statements throughout scripture. Acceptance, admission, as they say in AA, is the first step, right? And that definition of acceptance is defined as, hear this, a willingness to tolerate a difficult situation. So let's open the door, shall we? I would offer up for our consideration today that as we learn to accept one another, that we welcome others into the doors of our lives, our church, and our world, not by showing them the door as we often do with those who are challenging to us, those who we have a hard time accepting, I would offer up that we open the door and welcome the disliked, the unlike us, and then the most like us. But I want to begin with the disliked. Our scripture lesson from Romans today suggests that the disliked are these outsiders, the term that they use, not only those on the other side of the fence, but those we don't necessarily like over on the other side of the fence, those we can barely tolerate, you know, on a good day. When we woke up happy on the right side of the bed and every star in the sky aligned just right, and Venus is not in retrograde and the ocean is not churning with uh, hurricanic winds and fires aren't blazing in the west due to high winds and no rain and lava hasn't loosened from those volcanoes, you know, all of that. Luke lists several of these unlikables in Luke chapter 5. The dislike because of their reputation, the dislike because of their disease, the dislike because of their ability or lack thereof, and then the dislike because of their position. Y'all, up in the Bible, there's good stuff in there. And this is just one chapter of the whole Bible. But let's talk about the dislike first of those with questionable reputations. Luke 5 begins with Jesus on the banks of the Gennesaret with a crowd pressing in because he had been teaching. They saw what he was doing with healing and things like that, and so they pressed in to hear what this man had to say. And so as Jesus got closer to the lake, he saw some fishermen over on the side cleaning their nets and asked Simon, one of those boat owners, if he could use his boat and if Simon would take it out just a little ways into the water so that Jesus could sit there and then teach all of those on the banks of the river. And Simon 
obliged. And so after speaking with the crowd for a while, Jesus turns to Simon and speaks to him, encouraging him to, you know, drop the net and, and see maybe if you might catch a little more fish this time out on the lake. And perplexed, Simon reminds Jesus, you know, been there, done that all night long, you know, in my best line of Richie voice, all night long, right? Uh, but Simon did it anyhow. He went ahead and did as Jesus asked. And you remember when they lifted those boats, when they put those nets on the, on the lake and then they brought them in, it was so full that the boat began to sink. Simon then takes one look at Jesus and immediately knows that it was at Jesus' hands that this miracle had taken place. And just then, Simon gets a little nervous. And, and this has to be, he thinks, this holy man who could make such things happen. And so Simon also knew he was far from holy. We often dislike in others what we don't see in ourselves. If you can't say men, say I don't. Jesus didn't let Simon off the hook and invited him to join him. Him and all the others, fishermen that were around, regardless of their past or even their present. And Simon and his friends followed Jesus. Immediately, Luke writes, they left their nets and followed Jesus. And then the scripture goes on to talk about the disliked because of their disease. It says they go along and after the disciples start following Jesus, they met up a group. Uh, they met there where there was a, a, a leper standing nearby. These people were ostracized and disliked because of their disease. And this one leper, Luke writes, cries out to Jesus, if you wish, you could heal me of my disease. And Jesus replied, I do wish, be cleansed. And immediately the leper is cured of his contagious disease, no longer having to be disliked by the public because he was no longer a threat to them. And then it goes on to say that, that, um, that Jesus goes to this house nearby and, and um, people dislike people because of their ability or, or maybe the lack, their lack of ability and someone else has it. And so uh, Luke writes that Jesus goes to this house and remember he's teaching, he's healing and he was so popular that the house was full. You could no longer even get in the door. And these friends of a paralytic heard that Jesus was in town and so so they go and they gather up their friend on his stretcher and four of them carry each side of that stretcher and they carry this man to Jesus because he was unable to get there on his own. Sometimes somebody's got to accept you where you are and take you where you need to be. I'm grateful somebody took me to where I needed to be when I could not get there on my own. And you remember, they go in that house and they can't get in, so they take the roof off the house and they lower their friend in. You'll sometimes do anything to get to Jesus. Now this paralyzed man is healed. But the Pharisees, who also crowd the room, they're paralyzed by what Jesus said to this invalid. Jesus said to the man, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees are like, say what? Who do you think you are? Okay, this man who couldn't walk could now walk, and they're worried about semantics. Jesus healed him in more than one way, and they're stuck on Jesus being able to do something they can't and what they disapprove of. Oh, snap. Tell me the Bible is not relevant for today. People get all upset because Jesus will do something for those they don't want anything to do with. And then... Let's move on in the end of the fifth chapter of Luke to disliked because of their position. This is the pièce de résistance, the miracles that Jesus had performed come in all types. He's healed the sick, he's freed the oppressed, he's shown power over nature and sickness, but perhaps the greatest miracle is the greatest one that closes out this chapter where Jesus invites the most disliked to join his circle of disciples. Jesus, unlike most folks, and particularly the religious self-righteous, is capable of separating people from their past, their mistakes, and their moral failures to lift the weight of shame and guilt. And this might just be the weightiest evidence of all that Jesus is of God and embodies the message of God by the way he treats and includes people who are typically or usually excluded. 
in the same way that Jesus had communicated God's message through these signs and wonders that everybody was amazed. And Luke tells us that Jesus was walking along the road and saw a tax collector named Levi. Jesus encouraged him, follow me, he said. And Luke tells us, and Levi did. He got up from his desk and left everything just as the fisherman did at the beginning of that chapter to follow Jesus. And so, to show his appreciation, Levi held a dinner in honor of Jesus and invited many of his friends and associates, including many other tax collectors who also worked for Rome. And Luke records, everyone sat at the table together. But the Pharisees show up again. I liken them to the gay bashers who always show up at the pride parades. You know, a little more comfortable than they want you to believe and, and as curious as they are conniving. But anywho, whispering in what Reverend Perry likes to call a stage whisper, you know, whispering loud enough for people, for people to hear you, but pretending like you have a pretense to be respectable, but you're not. And so Jesus is at the other table and the Pharisees begin to question them why Jesus would be eating and drinking with tax collectors and other immoral, sinful people. The Pharisees, deeply committed to their own traditions and their interpretations, their interpretations of God's law, thought it God's job and consequently those who represented God to judge others and destroy sinners, not forgive them, let alone eat with them and enjoy their company. So Jesus, overhearing their whispering, answered for those disciples. Healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. I haven't come for the pure and upstanding. I've come to call notorious sinners to rethink their lives and turn to God. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus spent little time wasting his breath on those who refused to learn and listen. So take my advice. People who don't want to change won't change. And so waste your time on those who are willing to turn their lives around and who understand there's really nothing better than knowing Jesus. But anyway, instead Jesus hung out with the dislike to show that they too are worthy of God's love, attention, and acceptance. So how might we, saints of joy, how might we open the door again to acceptance to the disliked in our world? Consider the disliked with disreputable reputations, the disliked with amazing abilities, the disliked because of their disease or disliked because of their position. And then I invite you to sit down with them, share a meal, much like those in our contemporary word did and found Jesus in the midst of the meal. And while we're at it, let's invite and welcome the door and open the door not just to the disliked, but secondly, to those most unlike us. Jesus welcomed and opened the door to the Samaritan woman at the well and spent time with her, though she was completely unlike Jesus. She was female, Samaritan, and divorced not once but five times. Jesus was male and Jewish and, as far as we know, unmarried. That would get you unwelcomed in most churches, <laughs> but not with Jesus. Think about it. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, he had journeyed to Jerusalem to worship in the temple and was on his way home when the Spirit nudged Philip to go down that wilderness road. Remember the narrow way that Jesus talked about and go meet up with this man, this eunuch. And so the scripture says in Acts, Philip went. And when Philip came upon the chariot in which the eunuch was riding, Philip heard familiar words from the prophet Isaiah where the son of humanity would be despised and rejected and asked the eunuch if he understood what he was reading. And the eunuch, so wanting to understand, invited and welcomed Philip into his space. And Philip, the scripture says, shared with him, the good news about Jesus who had been rejected and humiliated. The eunuch, likely having just been rejected and humiliated at the temple, could relate to Jesus in many ways that perhaps others couldn't. 
Philip didn't let what was unlike between the two of them separate them any longer. The Ethiopian eunuch was from another country, was a gender variant person, and was an official of the high court of the Queen Candace. Philip had been a Jewish male disciple of Jesus, and in no way these two were the same. But when they got to some water, the scripture says, Philip got out and baptized him. The water welcomes all of us, just like God's table welcomes all of us. Lastly, as we attempt to open the doors to happiness in our own lives, I would offer up that we not only invite the disliked and the unlike us, but that we invite those most like us to God's table. Perhaps they're part of your family. Perhaps they're part of your church. Perhaps they're part of your small group. Perhaps they're part of your, your em employer. And you get a chance to, to spend some time with them on the night that Jesus was to be handed over to suffering and a death. The scripture says that he met in the upper room with all of his friends, gathered around friends who would end up turning their back, denying, betraying, abandoning Jesus. And he met with those that had spent three full years working and walking with them. And they still obviously didn't get it. Folks who were different, but who had become friends because Jesus had opened the door to them for three solid years. Folks within his own circle and sphere of influence. And as he sat around that table, there were fishermen and tax collectors and a myriad of other folks in between who gathered. And Jesus accepted, welcomed, and fed every single one of them regardless of their position, their expressions, their understandings, or their abilities, none of that kept them from being accepted or welcomed by Jesus. Accept one another, the scripture says, as Christ has accepted you. I don't know about you, but that's going to mean we accept a lot more people than we have. We used to sing a song when I was at the church, the MCC in Houston, and it was entitled, All Are Welcome. And here are the lyrics. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true, where all God's children dare to seek to dream God's reign anew. Here the cross shall stand as witness and a symbol of God's grace. Here as one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where love is found in water, wine, and wheat. A banquet hall on holy ground where peace and justice meet. Here the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space. As we share in Christ the feast that frees us, all are welcome. All are welcome. All are welcome in this place. Saints, if we are to open the door to happiness, we must first open the door to acceptance and welcome those we dislike, those most unlike us, and those a lot like us to all gather around the table of grace. At the table of grace, the cup's never empty, the plate's always full, and it's never too late to come and be filled with love never ending. You're always welcome at the table of grace. May this open door of acceptance be the new way that we continue being hope and being love and being Jesus in the world. May it be so, and it is, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm Sarah. I moved to Orlando a couple of years ago, and one of the first things I did was Google um, Affirming Churches and, and came across Joy MCC. And over the years, I've appreciated the love and the affirmation, the community that Joy MCC offers and is to this city. 
most recently I became a member as well. And during this time of pandemic and uncertainty, it's it's important that we give and that we invest into those communities that, that bring us hope, that bring us affirmation, that bring us community. I encourage you as you are able, knowing that we've all been impacted financially in some way with the pandemic. So as you are able to continue to give to Joy MCC so that in this time where so much is changing and so much is uncertain, we still have the stability of this awesome community of Joy MCC. So I invite you today, whether that's sending in a letter um, with a check via the mail, whether it's giving online, whether it's text to give, whatever is easiest for you to please go ahead and continue investing in this awesome grace-filled community that is a shining light to this city. Thanks. Bless me, O oh Lord. Amen. The prayer of Jalice. Right here. Amen. God bless you, y'all. Good word, Pastor. <laughs> We'd like to welcome you to the table that breaks down the walls and builds bridges. Here we welcome those who do not look like us, do not live like us, or don't even think like us. But this is a place for all humans to gather and come together and find the peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He has united Jew, Jews and Gentiles into one body. He has united gay and straight, black and white, all people into Christ's own body on the cross. He broke down all the walls of hostility that separate us. And so we gather here this morning as a table of peace that welcomes you and has a place for you serving the one God who loves us all and welcomes us to God's presence. So as we come together this evening, we remember our Lord Jesus Christ at this table. The night that he gathered in that upper room with those that he loved before he was to go to the cross and die, our Lord, he took a piece of bread knowing what he was about to face, looking at those that he loved. Jesus raised the bread and he blessed the bread. He broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body that I give for you. Whenever you come together and break bread, remember me. In the same manner, our Lord, he took a cup and he raised it before those that he loved, and he blessed the cup. And he said, this cup represents the covenant between the parents in heaven and I. Every time that you break bread and you drink from this cup, remember me. Let us pray. Lord, we lift these elements this morning before you in our living rooms, in our kitchens, in our cars, and in this sanctuary. And we remember you. May these elements become the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the parent, the son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we gather around this table of grace, I invite you to take whatever piece of bread you may have, whatever that looks like, because it doesn't matter and you dip it into whatever cup you may have that represents the new covenant of God and know that these are the gifts of God and they are for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, we thank you for this table of grace. That the cup's never empty, the plate's always full. It's never too late. May we be filled with love never ending. Thank you, God, for welcoming and accepting us at this table of grace. Amen. Señor, gracias esta mañana por esta mesa de gracia. Sabiendo que tu amor está con nosotros. Tu presencia estás con nosotros. Y sabemos que tenemos tu paz. En el nombre de Jesucristo. Amen. by welcoming all those who may come. May you feel welcomed as you have been accepted. Accept others as Christ has accepted you. Now let's go be Jesus for the world. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. 